right, folks. Um, thank you so much for joining us from all over the world. Uh, welcome to the uh, Australian, apparently, uh, safe <laughs> online meetup. Uh, all are welcome and uh, not at all unusual to have folks from uh, all over. Uh, quite a crew today from uh, all over Australia, I can see, uh, India, uh, the UK, um, some Texans, some folks from Seattle, uh, Chicago, I think, Calgary, uh, really quite an impressive range of, mm -hmm. of folks. Um, so we, um, we set this up uh, because people are always asking us about safe at serious scale. And if you've been in the classroom with, with Adrian or I, uh, you will hear us talk about Boeing and our friend Debbie at Boeing. And then I went, actually, you know what? I should just get our friend Debbie at Boeing to talk to you lot instead of me talking about Debbie to you. Um, so Debbie has been doing this, uh, been in the safe space as long as me, which is really unusual. I know very few people who have been uh, been in this space as, as long as I have. So I think uh, Debbie and I both have the uh, the honour of being people who have been doing safe since before it was called safe. Um, so yes. uh, another. <laughs> early adopter. Uh, so Debbie is the uh, head of the, the LACE at um, Boeing, uh, working out of uh, Boeing headquarters uh, in Seattle, Washington or thereabouts. Uh, she has, uh, last year she became a, an internal SPC, or year before actually, became an internal SPCT. So she uh, teaches the SPC class to folks inside Boeing. Uh, and the end of last year, she became a safe fellow, I think, from memory, which yes. is very exciting. We are yes. um, slowly growing the amount of women on the safe fellow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is the safe fellows, which is awesome. Um, look, I'm obviously super excited to, to have Debbie here today. Uh, this is a, um, a session she did at the Safe Summit, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, she's done a little bit of an update for us to tell us uh, where where they're at, but um, I think without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Debbie. I'm going to let her uh, do her thing for the most part and then take questions at the end uh, for those who are um, interested in asking questions and hanging about. Uh, we think she's got about an hour's worth of material. Uh, we can hang around a little bit afterwards for those who have additional questions and don't have to run right on the right on 1.30. Um, but uh, on that note, I think, Debbie, they're all yours. All right. Thank you for the introduction. And I, I was telling Em right before this that when I um, presented this, I think this was at the um, 2019 Safe Summit in San Diego. Uh, I, I created a, a um, like a, about a 25 minute presentation, assuming about a 15 minute Q&A. And then they put me on the big stage uh, in the main conference room and they said, okay, you have an hour and you can't do Q&A. <laughs> and so I, I did, a, I did a, a little stretching of the material so I can um, probably get it back down to something that's reasonable here. Um, so my, the title of my presentation was Supersizing Safe. Um, and I'm talking about what we did in our digital transformation uh, in Boeing. Uh, this, I, I joined um, the D digital enterprise. Uh, well, you can see that's me. I don't need to talk about that. Um, I joined a digital enterprise in about the end of 2017. And um, wh what we, we were, what I want to tell you is what we're doing in our digital transformation, what we talked about when we created the super solution train which is the scale supersizing part. And then some practices that we created that help us align across that large um, network of value streams. And then a little bit about how our business and technical architectures will evolve. So many folks are on our digital transformation journey. Um, and the, the point is this effort isn't just about new technology. Culture and architecture play key roles in that transformation. And um, as we know from the transportation industry with Uber and Lyft and from our, how we do our banking now and how we um, stream movies with Netflix, almost all industries out there are being affected by the digital age. 
And for companies like Boeing who build big physical products, um, creating digital twins or software representations of those products are going to help us um, to reduce the cost of change and enable more rapid deployment. Um, but we really need to first uh, bring those tools in, learn how to use them, and then look at our work systems and how we need to change those work systems going forward. So this um, initiative started shortly after Boeing turned 100, uh, which was in about 2016. So we've been on this uh, uh, journey for a little while. And it is a company-wide um, uh, transformation talking about uh, changing processes, how we do data and our technology. So it's, it, it's driven by IT, it was led by our CIO, um, and it's essentially the future of Boeing to how we want to achieve our vision of being the best in aerospace and an enduring global industrial champion. And when I joined the program, there were about 5,000 people in the program um, some of them within IT and some of them uh, within the business itself. So it was, it was huge <laughs> going into it and understanding the scope of it. I got involved um, in 2017. And the interesting thing was that I was at the SAFE Summit and I was in one of the last sessions or it was an after summit class. And I got a call from one of the chief architects um, on, on this program asking me if I could help implement SAFE across the program. And I, I just about jumped on the airplane and went right home because the, uh, this was exciting for me because I'd always um, encountered uh, resistance when, go, when uh, doing a transformation. And so here was a chief architect saying, no, we want to, we want you to help us. And so I was just thrilled with that um, and as soon as I got back from the summit, I, I met with some leaders. We kind of developed a strategy and started to move forward. The, um, the, it, these are the, the strategies that they had in place already before I joined. So that made me really excited that, you know, they already had looking at the architecture, looking at process improvements, bringing in agile. I wouldn't have called it work processes, but um, you know, <laughs> you get what you get. Uh, a lot of this was bringing in um, off the shelf capabilities so that we weren't customizing everything for uh, our internal Boeing use. And then um, making sure that we got that cross-functional collaboration across the company. So um, let's see, the, there was a lot of opportunity here. And one of the things that really, um, got me was that while we were using SAFE, we were going to be building that same construct into our business processes as we redesigned them, because we knew that's what we needed to enable the digital strategy. Oh, come on, come on. So we had some enablers with our culture. At the time, we had a really great Boeing vision and what we called our Boeing behaviors that you can see at the bottom of the screen there. Um, they were from our um, previous CEO, Dennis Muhlenberg. Um, and he had this vision of Boeing being a global industrial champion. And he had some clear strategies that would allow us to enable that vision. Um, so that was part of it. And one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to take those vision and behaviors and connect them with the lean agile values and principles so that we made sure that whatever we were doing was tied to the strategy from the top. <clears throat> and, and you can see even down here, um, we talk about the uh, B champions and win with speed, agility and scale. And so we were like, yes, I had the word agile in the strategy. Woo. Um, and then we would bring in different agile ways of working. So we not only were looking at safe, but we had also um, developed this concept of a balanced team within Boeing. And it's just this little icon here about um, desirability, feasibility, and, and uh, viability, which gets into the whole UX concept. 
And so we, we said, okay, so at the team level, you can be a scrum team, you can be a Kanban team, or you can be one of these balanced teams. So we weren't trying to come in and say, nope, we're changing you. Um, we tried to incorporate uh, what, we, what we had in there. So integrated, and then um, making sure that we were looking at continuous integration and delivery. So bringing in that DevOps culture, um, using the, we have a Boeing analytics team that was going to help us uh, with the data and bringing in the right analytics so that we could learn. Um, and, and also the continuous learning culture so that we would not become complacent in our products or our processes. And just the recognition that change is a constant and the right culture can ensure that we are all um, working together and using it to our advantage. And this is the one slide where I missed the, the two CES logo. Um, this, used to, <laughs> this used to be called Second Century Enterprise Systems and recently we changed it to Digital Enterprise. So just ignore that. <laughs> So now let's shift to a conversation about what supersizing really is. Uh, during my first two weeks with this program, I realized that um, there was great support and energy for doing something different. Um, so uh, one year prior to me coming in, uh, the IT organization launched this digital transformation environment where they were incorporating concepts from Pivotal Labs and uh, leveraging that to improve our software development processes and outcomes and enable the mindset and culture to move forward. So the strategies incorporated that. We had our CIO leading the efforts. He not only could say the word agile, but he actually knew what he was talking about. So that was really awesome. And it became powerful at a team level uh, for many software teams but, um, but was challenging when we got outside of the software area. So when we went and talked to the business architects, when we went and talked to the enterprise architects, when we um, got into the leaders that were helping us um, run the program, that's where we uh, kind of had to uh, do, do things a little differently, understanding the scale. I also found out that we were using many of our legacy um, processes to manage this program. It, it was such a, a large investment for the company and we have certain dollar thresholds where we have to um, have different oversight. And so I don't know if any of you are familiar with a concept called earned value management. Yes. <laughs> Um, they, they were applying Thankfully that to this so. program. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy, I know you would. <laughs> um, so they were using earned value management driven planning and budgeting. And um, it wasn't like hardcore earned value management, but they were still trying to do six month rolling wave plans um, that were developed using a siloed process that each organization would do their own plan and then that it'd come to the program management office and they'd review that plan. And then there was no connection between the plans. Um, and uh, besides this, there was no shared visibility of work between the different value streams that were involved. And in my first couple of weeks, I got invited to a workshop over here and a workshop over here. So there was a lot of disruption to the work that was going on. Um, and trying to get people together. And even when I went into some of those meetings, I saw three people talking to one another and 25 people sitting on their laptops, not engaged. So, so you know, it, it was, we need, we had some work to do. <laughs> um, so, so we really had to look at each of these uh, value streams and um, investigate each part to uh, truly grasp the size. So my strategy was guided by some basic rules. Start where you are. This program had been going for two years already and they had made commitments and they had deadlines and they already had plans. And so I had to come in and say, we couldn't pause and reset. We had to take it from where it was. Um, part of my thing was honor what the organization had already been through. Um, there'd been a lot of other transformation changes going on within IT. And I didn't wanna make this seem like just yet another one. I wanted to 
make it be the next step in our learning journey. Um, so we didn't want to come in and, and disrespect people. We, we focused first on essential safe and agile teams. So try and get that agile mindset. And then knowing that we already had the scale, we had to at least get the essential safe work going. And we wanted to be aggressive, but also acknowledge those existing milestones and commitments. So where could we make those changes? Where do we, did we have to hold back? Um, aligning to the emerging culture. So uh, like I was saying earlier, connecting to that Boeing mission, vision, and behaviors and other corporate initiatives. But also number three, shift the mindset. So we really needed to get people thinking differently. Um, and, and as everyone knows, once you go digital, there are a lot of things that you're, you have to do differently in your business. So if you try and bring in new tools and you don't change the processes that are behind that, um, it, you're, get, you're not going to be as successful. So we also uh, brought in a lot of framework and role-based training to try and help with that. We embedded coaches in the, in the organization. So I started requesting five Boeing coaches, five external coaches. I got two Boeing coaches and six external coaches, <laughs> um, which wasn't but my, my idea was that I wanted to grow our competency by pairing us up with externals. And then slowly, as we built our competency, we could um, you know, shed the external support or bring in support as we needed. Um, and then we also did a lot of experiential workshops. So uh, value stream mapping, um, executive workshops to, to start um, changing the mindset because executives won't take training, at least in, <laughs> in my world, they, they don't have the time. So you've, you've got to get them um, into workshops and, and let them experience it themselves. So now let's talk about the scale. Um, so prior to actually joining the program, I had been working with one of the Agile release trains and just for, um, obfuscating what part of the program this was. It's, this is value stream number one, art number one. So that's my nomenclature there. So I'd already started with them earlier in 2017 and they were the first ones to actually launch an art. Um, and so with my strategy in place and I had that team of, uh, I started with six coaches that, that grew later, uh, we basically um, launched our Lean Agile Center of Excellence. So um, trying to connect that to the program management office and um, start setting up the training program and, uh, and reaching out to all these different value streams to see where they were and how big they were. And so we then brought in, whoops, I'm going too fast. Um, we then, after we, we got through our introductions in the first quarter of 2018, and by May of 2018, we had <clears throat> three more arts to launch. Um, the SA art was an art full of architects. Not ideal, okay. <laughs> Not ideal, but okay, we had them. They, they were on board. They were happy. They were... They were doing some, uh, uh, they created agile teams and they had a backlog and they were creating transparency. Um, we brought in one art from each of the other two value streams and, and, uh, and started uh, working there. And then um, as we got into that program increment, we realized that we didn't have alignment on the plans that we brought into the program increment across the different agile release trains. So what we did, what we created was a solution planning workshop. And I'll demonstrate or I'll talk about what that is um, later in the deck. But um, essentially, it's four weeks prior to PI planning, making sure that all of the arts are aligned on the strategy coming from the program and creating a roadmap that will help us get um, our dependencies worked out between, between the arts. So our first truly aligned workshop then happened in August of um, 2018. And so there we go. Oh, 
now we brought in an art full of business architects. Yay. <laughs> okay. Um, value stream number two brought in two, two new arts and value stream number three now added a second art. So um, uh, we, we realized at that point in time that um, this is bigger than six coaches worth. We need more coaches. So we reached back to IBM and uh, who was our partner on this and we brought in some more coaches. We were rolling out some more training. Um, and at this point in time, remember I said, focus on essential safe. Well, all of these value streams started thinking them of themselves as solution trains. So now, not only do we have these many arts, but each one of them thinks they are their own solution train. So what we did was we said, okay, we are a super solution train that is composed of multiple solution trains within, okay. Now you can see where my scaling is going. All right, get into November. Up, oh, value stream number two brings in two more arts and value stream number three stays steady. Oh, we need to bring in another value stream. Okay. So value stream number four was very interesting because when we originally started, we knew about them and we were told, no, don't touch them. They've got a delivery. They need to make that delivery and then we can convert them to safe. They missed their delivery date by 12 months. So <laughs> somewhere in there, we decided we're not waiting anymore. We need to get you guys in, in an art and get aligned so you're, you're going safe. So we at least got some of them uh, uh, started in that. Um, then we basically value stream number two here, they, they've got five arts. Now they think they're a solution train. So that's the large solution train versus the super solution train concept. Value stream number three, yep, they're now a large solution train as well. And um, then we decided, okay, let's look at um, distributing our coaches and our laces. Each one of these, if they're gonna be their own value stream, they have their own problems. They have their own transformation uh, changes that they need to make. So we started the hub and spoke um, method of our, our Lean Agile Centers of Excellence. And we basically told each of those these value streams to stand up their own lace. And we kind of called it a doily at first, but people didn't like that. So we did LOL, lace of laces. And that was basically a cadence in which we would get the, the laces together to collaborate on the process improvements that we were making across the different trains. Get into 2019, yep, value stream number two is, is scaling, value three, value stream number three is scaling, value stream number four keeps one, that's good. Um, so yes, we are growing even more um, and, and that continues into May. Oh my gosh, eight <laughs> arts within value stream number three. And uh, what's this ISD art? This is our integrated solution delivery art. So all the way up to this point, there have been small things that have been delivered. But what I found at this point was DevOps hadn't been integrated into everything and not all of these solutions were integrated together. That was the integration group. That was the operations group. So we finally brought them in as an art and got them planning and um, aligning with what everyone else was doing. These, are, these were surprises that uh, I did not expect to uncover at that stage of the transformation. Um, so into July, uh, value stream number one finally added a second art and everybody else just stayed the same. So whew, um, thank goodness we didn't uh, grow anymore at that point in time. Uh, things were going along to pretty well, but uh, even with blowing these arts up in that way, many of them were too large. 
and the organizations were still operating using some of their previous work systems. And um, at the time that I presented this, I said, I fully expect the number of arts to continue to grow. I, I asked about a week ago to the group, how many arts do they have? It's about the same number right now. So they haven't grown more. There's been some descoping of some work. So some of the work has um, been reduced and that's fine. Um, but we're still not necessarily organized around value streams. And the other thing is that this super solution train concept is really just enabling centralized decision making versus decentralized decision making. So we still have some work to do in terms of does everybody have to be on the exact same cadence? Does everybody have to be in the the large solution or the super solution planning or what does that look like? So um, still, and, and a lot of that is just changing the mindset at the leadership level. Um, so the benefits of the super solution train uh, were, and, and having this, all of these arts and all of these value streams was really that we started to get alignment across this large, large, large organization. Um, these these pop-up meetings that I talk about talked about, they did not happen as frequently because we could plan them into the program increment. And we could say, hey, I have to have a meeting. Here's the topic, here's the people that I need. And we could put it on the backlog and, and make it a, a, a milestone. Um, they all operated with a shared mission, cadence, and backlog. Um, I think we struggled a little bit with tooling in order to make sure that our, our uh, backlog management tool could just show all this. Um, our our uh, architecture teams were still organized into arts, but at least they were thinking agile, they were acting agile. Um, so that was really good. And, and I think probably the architectural runway was actually lagging what the arts were doing. So, um, so it was kind of like the architects would go, okay, here's the direction that we're going to go. And the, the value streams would go, oh, wait a minute, we already implemented that. And we used a different solution. So it, it was a, bit, a little bit of catch up that we had to do. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I think in the value stream four, um, they, they had some, they were able to learn and succeed in their safe, safe implementation. And that success has shown um, the remainder of that organization that that safe is a good thing. And they are doing a complete transformation in that organization now towards safe. Um, but they still have to learn. <laughs> and that is our HR organization. So that's a good thing. Um, so uh, as we were doing this, I, I asked myself, how many arts does it really make sense to have in a solution train? And then how do I operate a super solution train? Um, I can tell you that we had another program going at the same time as this one, and they were kind of scoping out what their program would look like when they got into full operations. And they had scoped out 33 agile release trains. So, um, so we, that was another large one, and that was probably going to encompass about 4,000 people, maybe 5,000 people um, building an airplane or designing an airplane to be built. Uh, so, so these are some of the things that, that we had to think about as we were doing this, because there really is no guidance within SAFE on how many arts in a, in a solution train and, and this whole concept of, of this large of a coordination amongst solution trains. So let's talk about some of the practices. So we created this view and this, um, this was, is from a great article that's in um, the safe advanced um, articles called Enterprise Backlog Structure and Management written by Charlene Quenza, who's an SPCT from ICON. 
Um, and in that article, she goes into, you know, we understand what teams are doing, but what is the art level work that we're doing? What is the solution level work that's going on? And so that's what we wanted to elaborate here. So, you know, here we have our PI, here we have our six iterations. We were on a, a 12, um, 12 week cadence there. And these are the things that happen for the for the um, solution level for the teams there for the different solutions that are in there. They're doing their sync, they're doing workshops and they're doing um, their demos at the solution level. But down here, what are we doing with the backlog? So we have to update the vision. We have to um, be pulling those new epics. I mean, as soon as we start working the PI, we have to be looking at what's the next PI that we're gonna go work on and make sure that we elaborate all of that and get the priorities going. So we'd pull new epics or capabilities and start refining them and, and get them um, prioritized and road mapped and what are the enablers that we needed um, and, and start to prep the architecture and then socialize that with our with the arts and the um, chief architects that are working for along with this. And then we, we'd, in the third iteration, we'd prep for this solution workshop that we held in the middle of the fourth iteration. And that j gave us, you know, basically four weeks until we went into PI planning. So that was an, uh, uh, enough of a time that people could align with one another on what overall priorities were gonna be for the next PI. Um, and then come together and workshop to uh, make sure that we got that alignment and transparency. And then the arts could go start planning their features, decomposing the capabilities and the epics and start to get their features ready um, in iteration five that they would then have ready to go into PI planning. So kind of at the top, we're doing the continuous integration of the work that we are implementing in this PI. At the bottom, we're doing the just-in-time refinement for the work that we're going to do in the next PI. So the solution planning workshop was that thing that where we brought people together from the at the art leadership level of every single agile release train. Um, and the idea was that we, we wanted them to bring in their solution and program backlogs with capabilities and features defined and run a similar exercise to program increment planning, but we didn't get down to stories. We stayed at features and capabilities. And the output of that workshop was to have them expand and refine their three PI roadmap so that they would they would have that there um, for the for the future, but also to really truly get aligned on the next PI that we were going to go into into planning for. Um, this also helped us with that earned value management approach. So instead of everybody going and doing their own plans in their own silos, they brought their plans into the solution planning workshop, got alignment, and then after they got alignment, then they could baseline that earned value management plan. So that helped us take the six month rolling wave planning approach that they had before that didn't align with the PI cadence into the PI cadence and make it more reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been some adjustments uh, that we've done from there. So. Part of the question that we had is who comes to this event? Um, we had release train engineers, product managers, system architects, the solution train engineer, solution managers, solution architects, and their representative business owners. Um, at one point in time, and some, some people were bringing all of their product owners as well. <laughs> I was like, no, that's, that's too much. Product managers should be able to handle the feature level um, and and if <clears throat> if you can't, maybe you're not doing your job right. <laughs> so, how did we um, uh, work these? It's a little 
different than PI planning. Um, the real thing that we were trying to do was growing that social network. So people could get to know one another. We, this this um, uh, organization on this program is global. So it wasn't based just in, um, in the US. I mean, we have all three time zones in the US covered. Uh, we also included a lot of folks from India um, and a few folks from the UK in this. So um, pretty global, global team. So our first workshop, solution workshop that we did, we um, took the team breakouts and we made them art breakouts. You know, so normally when you go um, into the team breakout planning, it's by agile team. Well, we said, okay, let's do it by art. And it worked okay, but we learned from that. And what we realized was that we needed to have more interaction and transparency across the arts. That really wasn't getting us the, uh, the uh, transparency that we need. So what we did, and one of our uh, coaches uh, from Accenture brought in this concept of speed dating. So if you're familiar with the concept, the, the real concept of speed dating, it's spend five minutes at a table interacting with the person and see if you want to make a date with them, right? So we took that concept from the art to art perspective and we had every art make a speed date with every other art so that we could start having that cross art dependency conversation. Um, that worked pretty well, uh, but then we, we refined it in the next workshop and, um, and, and what we did now was we, we focused our breakouts on either agile release trains or capabilities that needed to be better defined. So we'd have some people that were focused on their own art, some of the capabilities that were cross art. And then we also did the, the speed dating as well for you know, just making sure that we could bring people um, together more. Finally, what we um, ended up with in our fourth workshop, and I think this continues today, is that we had some enabler capabilities on a certain track. We had some feature-like capabilities. We did some speed dating and we did some um, agile release training breakouts. And we just had different tracks throughout the day in four different locations that people could go to. It, it got kind of chaotic, but if you had the map of where people were, it was, it was okay, it worked out pretty well. Um, and we use the same tools. You can see in the pictures, there's stickies on the wall, there's a program board that we used um, so that we could show the, the connection of the capabilities and who was doing what. And um, I, I remember uh, when we were doing one of our report outs, seeing our, um, one, our chief architect tracing the string from one and to the other so that he could see how the dependencies went across the strings. So that was kind of cool. Um, the other thing that we had to uh, work a little bit was the IP sprint. And we struggled with dependencies and, and I would say the struggle with dependencies was because our arts weren't formed right. Um, and so we were like, okay, when does the large solution train do their PI planning? When do the arts do their planning? Um, so we kind of had the large solution train concept here and then the art concept. Um, that was our first experiment. Our second experiment, really we moved to the large solution pre-PI planning to the, the Mondays and then the arts could do their um, own planning and then our post PI planning was the following Monday because no kidding, we used that. This was not optional. <laughs> Friday was, if by Thursday you have not resolved your dependencies with all the other arts, Friday is dependency resolution day. <laughs> and then um, when I left um, the program, this was my recommendation. And this was modeled after uh, what we had done on some other programs within Boeing where we took PI planning and we spread it across three days. And in the middle, we had an art to art sharing day so that we could um, do readouts between the arts and do dependency resolution during those days. Because no kidding, if you do your dependency resolution after you've finished your plan, you haven't really finished your plan. Um, 
And then we wanted the super solution trained PI planning to kind of come earlier and later in the week. So, um, so I can't really tell you if this worked <laughs> or if they're actually using it, but, <laughs> but this was uh, what, what I'd proposed. And if there's any other organizations that um, would want to look at this, I have it documented somewhere, so. So definitely we needed to look at mo um, uh, sending our architecture. So um, this was a shift for us to model based everything. We wanted to model our business architecture. We wanna model the architecture of the systems that we're building. So we're bringing in Cameo, we're bringing in the concept of model based systems engineering. We're bringing in our analytics um, and also incorporated, uh, incorporating artificial intelligence and machine, machine learning as we go. And now that we have our business and strategic architectures using SAFE, um, we're, we're going to, the idea was we're going to start embedding them more into the arts. So it's not, it's less of a top down and it's more of an integrated approach um, moving forward. And when we started offering the SAFE for Architects class, that really helped our architect organization understand um, how they needed to decompose the, the the uh, architectural runway and the architecture itself. Um, that was probably one of our more challenging uh, implementations. And I think we, we just about killed one of our IBM consultants because he, <laughs> he was assigned to that team. So <laughs> he, he, he needed time to heal. Um, so I left the program in, uh, um, let's see, the middle of 2019. And what I did from there was I um, went to the enterprise level and I established a, an Agile Center of Excellence for Boeing. Um, you know, we had uh, this second century enterprise experiment going on. We had our um, new midsize aircraft program going on where we were learning how to design an airplane. And what we learned from both of those experiments was we didn't have the guidance to new programs that wanted to adopt SAFE about how to do it. We didn't have the tooling in place. We didn't have the training in place. And so that was the concept of, of the, uh, the Lean Agile Center of Excellence. And um, we're certainly not done by a long shot. Um, I saw something in the chat about how did the 737 MAX affect this? Well, <clears throat> this was prior to that. All of this happened prior to that. Um, and remember I said we there was some descoping that's gone on? <laughs> well, the descoping is because of the MAX and uh, COVID and the fact that COVID has hit the, the airline industry um, very hard, especially commercial airline industry. And so we've had to um, cut back in, in part of our part of our businesses that new mid-size aircraft program got canceled because why make airplanes when people aren't flying? Um, and we figured we had to heal our commercial um, airplane business before we even thought about um, building new. Um, and it, it, it really has shaken the company. So, um, but we're still there <laughs> and, uh, and we're, we're in a healing mode. I was telling Adrian and M that I think we, we finally um, had a positive aircraft sales month. Um, we've had a lot of negative ones with people canceling out of their um, max contracts and other, other contracts as well. Um, we've had, I think uh, the, our 777X program is, is going pretty well. Um, and, and of course, our, the commercial side of Boeing is um, also saved by the defense side of Boeing. And so, you know, there's a, there's a balance there. Um, lessons for me was that um, ensure your leaders understand their role in the transformation. Um, I came in, I heard good messaging, and then the actual ex execution from the leaders was not good. Um, and we still have that challenge. Um, so a new transformation, I go to the leaders first. I get their commitment, I get their contribution because it's not just their buy-in, 
they need to know that they're a part of the transformation and then um, make sure that they get trained or that you held, hold workshops or you get that mindset going for them. Follow the safe and agile values and principles. Don't be too rigid on the, on the practices. Learn about your context and what practices work um, for your context. Uh, you could be in a, in a, a much simpler environment that than what we're in. Um, and you wouldn't need to um, add the scale and add the complexity. So that, that's the other thing is only add scale and complexity where you need it. Definitely go in and with an experiment and learn approach. Um, don't assume that SAFE has all the answers for you because they don't. Um, and then um, challenge the status quo within your company, within your processes, within your organizations. I can't tell you how many times I um, ask people about how do we do this? Um, why do we do this? And finally, the, the, after I do my five whys and I ask, why do we do this? Um, the answer is, well, we've always done it that way. You know, so, so then go, okay, would you be willing to experiment and try something different? And if we can find a safe space to run the experiment, validate that it's the right thing to do and then scale it, that's really what we'd, we'd rather do. So I think there's still time for Q&A. <laughs> so thank you so, so much, Debbie, and, and thank you for um, sharing the, the warts and, and all tale. Um, really, really appreciate it. Um, there are, I think, a few questions that were dropped into, into chat as we, as we went. So I'll, I'll start there, then I'll open the, the floor to folks. Um, so first one from Abby, um, uh, as you added value streams and arts, can you explain what they were delivering? Um, if you could contextualize this for the solution you were delivering, it would be helpful. Don't know what you can share. Yes, it was something that I was specifically told to take off my charts. So, <laughs> because, because what they didn't want is to show the size of the effort in each one of those. So in general, I will tell you with those four value streams, I mean, I called out the, the architects in the top. So the architects were, were up here in the solution, the, the solution. And we also kind of had a program management office that resided there as well, that was helping direct it. And that was part of the LACE. Um, the other ones included, um, our manufacturing optimization management. So um, taking the factories digital was that piece of it. Um, let's see, product lifecycle management. So all of the infrastructure and tooling to help us um, uh, define, build and deliver uh, using the, um, the product lifecycle management tools. Um, the other one was our um, engineering resource planning uh, product. So this was a big infrastructure change for Boeing um, of all, all of those systems. And then looking at which systems we were going to replace and retire, bringing in COT solutions um, and not, uh, I, I don't know if anybody else has this, but we use this Boeingizing things. So we would always kind of, customize things and then it was hard to get back to what the industry standard was or get any help with it. Um, and then the last one was our um, human resources and all of the tooling to support human resources. So those, those were the, the major um, things that, that was included. What were they delivering? They were uh, configuring the COTS product. They were looking, blueprinting um, the solutions that we were going to implement, and they were changing business processes. So it was kind of a, a variety of things. There wasn't a whole lot of software development in this. It was more integrating systems, configuring systems, and looking at the business processes to, that need to drive those. Thanks, Debbie. Um, so we talked about the max. The uh, next question was Shibu. Uh, Debbie mentioned there was an executive workshop for leaders on shift in mindset. Can you please elaborate on the workshop that was conducted and the outcome? 
Um, yeah, so we used some uh, uh, different tools. I like to use the Lean Change Canvas um, approach that uh, from Jason Little. And so I brought that in with a couple of other um, thinking tools. Um, and, and I will tell you that um, that went reasonably well, but we did it the day before the solution workshop and the leaders wanted to dive right into what are we gonna build versus what's our strategy going forward. Mm -hmm. So that, that one went reasonably well. And in another one, I basically used the safe executive workshop mm -hmm. um, for the, the, um, the leadership team that was driving uh, Second Century. Uh, just to get them, I couldn't get them all in training. And so it was really just to m have them understand some of the um, transformational changes that they needed to make at a leadership level in order to enable the change. Thanks, Libby. And for those who aren't um, SPCs, the executive workshop is one of the many, many toolkits that the um, SPC community gets, gets access to from Scott Agile. Um, next one, Cindy, did you have the super solution train demos every PI? Yes, but they weren't really super solution train demos. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. What they, <laughs> what they were was find something exciting that someone's worked on and demonstrate it. Ah, okay. Sure. Um, okay. So it was about, it was about creating the energy around it. And, and then, you know, I cautioned them that at the super solution train level, they should be demonstrating integrated solutions. Um, and of course, you know, if I go back to, let's see, back to this slide. Um, re remember where I showed the integration art joining? <laughs> so up to that point, we were doing those demos, but it really wasn't an integrated solution that was being demonstrated. Um, there was a, a, a something that happened not too long ago where they actually, during the IP iteration, immersed a whole bunch of people from across the different solutions into a, a, a common workspace, and they all integrated their products together. And so that was, that was pretty cool that they managed to do that. That was pre-COVID, so I don't know what's happened since then, but um, but but at least they I think they learned that what they were doing was nice but it really wasn't what it was supposed to be <laughs> nice thank you uh next one from Mario do you have some metrics to compare pre-safe and post-safe adoption no <laughs> <laughs> <Great. laughs> just you not, not the only one <laughs> um but remember I said we had problems with the tooling. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what are backlog management tools really good at giving you? Story points. That's all we really had. We didn't, there wasn't a, a, with the, we were using Team Foundation Server and with the version that we had, there was no roll-up capability. So you couldn't mm -hmm. like roll up and say, you know, that we, we had this many, features, we had these, you know, this many um, capabilities. And so I had the CIO talking about how many story points the organization had completed during a previous PI. And I just about cracked my head open <laughs> because of that. So, so um, I wished we had pre and post um, metrics, but we're still working on the metrics part. Okay. Uh, next one's from Chula. Debbie, do all the trains in the super solution train follow a common cadence for the PIs? Yes, everybody is on the same cadence. Um, I think I showed that here. We, we uh, adopted, and this I, I recommended this because um, in my previous organization, I found this worked really well. We adopted a Wednesday iteration start and a Tuesday iteration end. And that was primarily because when we did Monday to Fridays, um, we had you know some Monday holidays, some Friday holidays, people sneaking out. Um, and in a previous program, 
uh, we had an organization that had a, every other Friday off. So, um, so it was hard to kind of uh, keep that, that cadence. So everybody was on this sprint schedule and on the same PI schedule. Right. Um, so we already talked about tools. Um, lovely note from Jeff here. Uh, such a great reminder. You can't get to scale without the basics. Great to hear about how you started with Essential Safe and the teams, etc. Um, with the art launches then scaled. Uh, Tomo, um, Debbie, typically in Safe for our single art, we ensure in PI planning we don't have dependencies between two different teams in the same iteration or sprint. We are currently trying to expand to a multiple art implementation. And I wanted to understand if you then ensure that there are no dependencies between different arts in the same PI. This was our logical progression of how to implement. And this is good since our arts in significantly different time zones. Uh, mm -hmm. I do realize it does constrain our agility. There's more. Uh, you talked a lot about the managing yep. dependencies between arts during PI planning. Any further elaboration on this area? Are you allowing interdependencies between arts during the same PI? I can't avoid it right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one of the things that we found is that some of the arts were completely independent. They had their own product. They really didn't have any integrations with any of the other um, teams, but they were part of that organization. And so they kind of got lumped in and they had to come along for the ride. And that's something where I said, don't scale if you don't need it. Um, because I really think that they would have benefited from not having to participate in the larger solution events and everything. They could have done their own thing. They could have gotten their alignment from the solution workshop. Great, if they needed it. Um, but, I, but I would look for ways to understand where we had those dependencies. The other thing is because all the architects were in one or two arts, um, we found that there were a lot of dependencies back to them. So um, that's why I would want to uh, distribute the architects more across the arts. Um, and then we also found a small part of the integration between the en engineering resource planning, product lifecycle management, and, um, and the manufacturing piece that was tightly integrated. And I would have preferred to take a whole bunch of people from across those three different domains and throw them into agile teams at a solution level and have them drive you know, the, those implementations at the arts that needed to do it. But the problem there was that we didn't have enough subject matter experts to do that. So we were kind of constrained in, in all sorts of uh, different places. If you can not have dependencies between teams or between arts, you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> we all dream of that day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so we are at um, just over 1.30 our time. There's still a handful of questions. Are you good to hang with us for a while, Debbie? You're just between okay. me and dinner, so, you know. All right. Well, eventually we'll let you eat, I promise. I'll, I'll just... <laughs> I'll, yeah. um, right. uh, so, uh, Mario, um, have you used team topologies at scale in one of your trains? Uh, no, but I'm really excited uh, to try it. So, um, it's on my bookshelf back there. Just recently um, finished it. We've been uh, talking about it ever since the Safe Summit, and I'm looking for an opportunity to um, try it out on an art or a solution train. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, Heather, I liked your IP sprint schedule, but how to secure an IP sprint? Usually my teams end up doing product work in the IP sprint, except the last day of IP for planning day one and day two. <laughs> um, <laughs> I made that very very explicit when I started is that we were going to preserve that time for planning. Um, I believe there were some organizations or some, some arts that were doing work leading up to the planning, um, but that was something that I told the coaches and the leaders that we really needed to preserve that time to make sure that we could um, you know, 
take a break, pause, and make a good plan for going forward. Uh, I know I, I went into, I was in a, planning for another um, organization that I coached uh, a year or so ago. And I walked around the room and I saw people, all sorts of sticky notes in the IP iteration. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was like, uh, so I went back to the, the senior manager there and I said, um, well, you realize at that at a minimum, you are going to be doing planning during that iteration. And so I said, do you want to set your teams up for success or failure? And I at least got him to say, preserve half of your capacity during the IP sprint for planning. Um, but really it is something that we coach and teach throughout. And I, I think people find that, um, that, uh, that it works for them. Um, but really the emphasis on innovation and finding time for it is really the key there. And when you don't do it, your product will stagnate. And so, um, you know, a, lo a lot of times it's, I can come back and I can tell you after it happened, why it happened, <laughs> you know, because you didn't preserve the IP sprint. Um, but we find a lot of people that have taken on too much work they are overwhelmed and they cannot see themselves not doing anything for that two weeks. And so I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I totally feel you on that one. I, I think just totally start to work with them and start to say, could you at least preserve half of that for planning? Could we at least uh, work on a backlog that talks about improvement items that we can do so that you'll see we're not actually putting our feet up on our desk and not doing anything, we're actually doing um, work that's positive in that time frame. Thanks, Debbie. Um, last one, I think. Uh, Debbie Curious, uh, Chula again. Debbie Curious to know what the current status of your super solution train is in terms of its evolution. And thanks for this wonderful session. Um, where it is right now, it still exists. It's still, um, uh, it's still very centralized, um, although we have a new CIO. Uh, she, she comes to us from Qantas, and um, uh, her name is Susan Donnes, and she seems to be really motivated to continue the agile transformation and to work on some of the leadership behaviors that have driven us to not be able to um, make improvements. So I'm excited about what this year might might bring, as well as, you know, we've had a lot of uh, layoffs within Boeing. I think I mentioned that, you know, we've, we've kind of hurt. Um, I almost think that some of the layoffs have been a little positive <laughs> in that some of the, um, the uh, impediments to our culture change are no longer there. Um, so who knows? Ask me again in a year. <laughs> Love you back. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Debbie. A uh, bunch of thank yous for you there in the in mm. the chat. As well, um, really, really appreciate it. Um, virtual <laughs> round of applause. For... <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, glad to glad to support. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for for joining us. Uh, we will uh, send you a a copy of the the recording for for joining us. Um, and um, hopefully we will see many of you at a meetup again soon. And Debbie, hopefully we'll see you in the, in the US one day again. Probably not this year, but probably not. <laughs> Maybe next or I'm year. gonna I'm gonna come see you. That's a plan. There you go. That's a plan. Those sort Never of know. Now. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again, Debbie. Really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>